cetera, flying around. Anybody in here seen those? The World Health Organization Physical Activity Guidelines. No is a perfectly acceptable answer, um, which is which is fine. So what I'm going to do is, as as part of this session, is I will upload it into the uh, into, into this week's learning, where what I'll just put it up here. You know, this is my highlighted version. I have to draw all over papers, otherwise I can't remember or recall the important things. Um, just a bit bigger. The World Health Organization have been building this uh, new stance on physical activity guidelines since uh, over the last 12 months and updated from 2010, giving very clear guidelines here on what we should be communicating to our patients, which is in this section here. There is information around prescription for kids right the way through to elderly, including special populations like pregnant women, how we should be physically active and for example if you are a pregnant woman who is very physically active you should remain very physically active in right the way through pregnancy and even postpartum clear guidelines that as an example has come into this most up to date that wasn't in the previous one but the guidelines around 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise is still very much the same or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous physical activity kids 60 minutes per day and basically goes through reiterating that exercise is probably good for everybody with every comorbidity morbidity from depression right the way through to obesity, cardiovascular problems, cancer, and so forth. There's implications in here for with working with um, people who live with chronic conditions, and again, how the application of exercise or the engagement in exercise for those people is uh, critical. And that's the word that they use in their table, is that it is critical. So. Uh, we're not hitting these guidelines and what I think a big um, takeaway from this paper, which you should definitely have, because this is what you've got to get across to your patients, is it doesn't really tell you how you're going to do that. And it certainly doesn't tell you how you're going to ensure that they are motivated and inspired to want to engage in these levels of physical activity. So this suggestions suggestions around how we make marketing campaigns and public awareness through through creating infographics and being able to get to the people who are working with people who need this information, healthcare professionals, we're definitely in that category Category in terms of how we do knowledge translation. And that's what this entire module with me has been about supporting you guys in trying to work with what I believe and what Paul is very passionate about is the major elephant in the room is, okay, you're saying this, how do you do it? And how do you make someone want to do it? That is something that I don't think has been answered. And this other paper, which I will upload here now, I'll also put it onto your resources, is this Karen Milton paper where they talk exactly about that. So how do we communicate these guidelines? How do we, you know, it's great. 150 minutes of exercise, you need to do that. Stop smoking. People know this. Everyone knows this. There's this really annoying thing that we talked about in the stress physiology session for those of you who were there that is we have this human psychology that makes things a bit more complicated and that, that is where motivation comes in and that is what i want to just pull you out to the bottom you can go in and you can have a look at the things that they discuss in this paper But what they say here is that effective communication to raise to raise awareness and knowledge of the physical activity guidelines may not be enough. Just telling somebody it's good for them doesn't hit that aff affective motivation that drives behaviour. So we need to be looking at creating supportive environments and opportunities for physical activity 
that are essential, these are essential components of population behavioral change. So that's, that's um, hitting what I believe to be the real nail on the head in terms of the problem here is, is, is you know, we know people are not physically active. We know that um, people are not adhering with exercise and this is general talking about general population you know the, it's not this to a point and this is something that robert sapolsky does at, uh, it says in the lecture that i put on for your stress physiology you know exercise is good more exercise is good an insane amount of exercise is not insanely good and then robert sapolsky says that in a very funny way so we're, we're talking here about general population not athletes and not your people who are generally needing reining in that's that's more of our athletes this is more our, more our general population and to pull this paper back up here when you went through my exercise induced exercise induced hypoalgesia session where we looked at how people with persistent pain of varying kinds they have a dysfunctional relationship with exercise where what should happen for the majority of us if we get this run as high we get a reduced pain threshold after a single bite of exercise whether it's aerobic exercise strength training walking dancing in people who have persistent chronic health issues like like persistent pain they have the opposite effect so again education becomes super important because they still benefit from all of the things that these guidelines are telling us if we can get them to be able to experience it and in here is so in that paper that was the rice paper around descending inhibition you have a shitload of protocols that are frameworks for you to be able to use for exercise prescription whether it's on a cycle ergometer whether it's walking whether it's using resistance weight training that's frameworks that i want you guys to use i might take for example a framework session that could be on the cycle ergometer that in incrementally goes up what every one minute and i would have that as one part of my session that I'm going to try and get other things into the session as well. That's where we can bring evidence-based practice and move it towards adapting to the person. But in this glossary of this paper, we have some nice categories of what constitutes physical activity. What is moderate to high intensity? What is low intensity? What is occupational exercise? What is um, recreational exercise and the one i've highlighted in green here is what i want to draw your attention to is multi-component physical activity which are activities that can be done at home or in a structured group setting or in a one-to-one -one setting obviously and combines all types of exercise which could be aerobic muscle strengthening balance training into one session and this has been shown to be effective an example of a multi-component physical activity program could include walking lifting weights and incorporate balance like play or like a lot of the things that i'm going to be segueing into your clinical reasoning for this session but this is what i'm supporting you in building a what a lot of people find challenging is with this diagnosis of non-specific aches and pains is being able to find a specific program that works for the individual. Although the effects may be non-specific in general, they're meaningful and specific to that person. And that's important because that's where, that's where it opens us up to be able to explore individualized individualized plans which in one of the sessions we went through the nice guidelines that tells your patients tells our patients to seek out a healthcare professional who can adapt and work out what's best for you that is often based on what they enjoy and that's really important for hitting the physical activity guidelines so what I've been supporting you with is clinical reasoning for building these multi-component programs with your patients. We've gone through stress physiology. So you have the basis there of fight or flight, rest and digest, autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system for being able to get someone to engage in, why they might try something that they enjoy. 
or something that they find relaxing or something that makes them feel good. Could be meditation, could be mindfulness, maybe something a little bit more uh, left field like music. Oh, I didn't realize that that could be part of my prescription, but I really enjoy music. So that's going to be something that's going to be part of my mindful, mindfulness when things are getting busy. Getting out in nature, clinical reasoning along those lines. We are going to be going through a session that is about the envelope of function. If, you got, if you've been onto my YouTube, if you've seen what I've done with the third years, I'm going to be doing that with you at some point around tendinopathy, which is incredibly important. Load management. That's where tissues are important, and that's where we need to be able to progressively load tissues in a way that enables them to adapt. So that leads us into the strength component of an exercise program. That could be in our very linear prescriptive ways that you'll see people lift in bench press, these more mainstream types of strength training, or it could be some of the more real life awkward movements like picking up an atlas stone or a lighter version of that, which every one of us has to do at some point in our life. So being able to, to have exercise and clinical reasoning to be able to do that as our rehab program should be returning people to being able to do that. And what I am, uh, the other thing we've already gone through clinical reasoning for aerobic exercise for when you're trying to communicate that with your patients with descending inhibition and being able to communicate how that doesn't need to be marathons but it does need to be something that gets our heart rate up a little bit and that can help calm our sensitive nerves down so you've got clinical reasoning for getting aerobic training into your patient in a storytelling way envelope of function haven't covered that yet for strength training stress physiology for relaxing things that could be um, individual to the person and what we're going to go through today is one of my favorite ones because by this point we've gone through a thorough assessment of the patient we've introduced a sensitive alarm system and an updated narrative around what pain is but maybe more importantly what pain isn't by dissociating a lot of the biomedical explanations that someone might have had for their shoulder pain you know my rotator cuff is causing my shoulder pain or my posture is causing my back pain or my firing patterns of my glutes or my abs i've been told in the past and we have a in our last session i can't be certain that you all of you had that we went through misconceptions how do we challenge people definitely look at that history taking and challenging beliefs now we're going to go through the clinical reasoning for a different type of exercise that is probably what back to roots is most well known for and this is the session for being able to support you in bringing out your own skill sets as a clinician that will be different to mine. They'll be different to Paul's. They, what we need you to be able to do is have the confidence to be able to draw upon what you've already got and then be able to seek for more things to build to what you've already got. So, I'm gonna start with sharing something that I got up to on the weekend. Not that. Whatever you thought that was. Apart from an incredibly cute dog, what is going on there? Lewis, do you care to jump on and elaborate? You're like the man himself, <clears throat> Pavlov Davis. <laughs> what was going on? What's going on there? 
Right, I only, I only watched a little bit of it because my um, internet connection's cutting out. But you're rewarding him for doing something which is deemed good, isn't it? Could you hear the sound? Yeah, a clicker. So that in the end, the click will be um, it's the same as holding your hand out for him to give you his paw, I believe, is it? Yeah, absolutely. So great, great effort. If you couldn't hear that there, guys, what's, what, what, what happened on the weekend? I went down to see my sister who's just got a puppy and I asked my sister to purchase a book, something that I've read. It's one of my favorite books around training and that's called Don't Shoot the Dog. And I've always wanted to be able to do it. I've read about it. Maybe some of you guys have trained animals. But this concept that Lewis just mentioned there, and I think Poppy put it into the box as well, was classical conditioning, whereby, and this is be a video that I would send to my patients and or a similar video to be able to lead into what is going on here. Two things happening at the same time. So dog sees food. Puppy sees food, and every time it sees food, it's going to be an automat automatic response to be able to salivate. That's not, that's not a conditioned response, that's automatic. And if every time I ring a bell, as Pavlov did, but I don't ring a bell, I click, those two things wire together. And when we talk in funny clinical language, we say it, it's got an ankle heavy and conditioning, and that means that neurons, which is something we talked about through this program, that fire together, they happen at the same time, they wire together. So what barley will do, if you can, every time you give him food, associate that click with food, we then have a, an opportunity to click with other things that he does to, for him to associate that with reward. And if you associate something with reward, what scientists in the 50s, behavioral scientists, did with lots of animal studies that I'm going to upload onto your blackboard after this is show that if you reinforce something positive as Poppy said there the behavior is more likely to happen again and that is something that enables us to be able to then build quite interesting movement behaviors because what's going on in Barley's head there is okay I've just sat down and that clicker just went off which means that that was something good last time. I'm going to do that again. Oh, yeah, it cause food again. And I don't know why I'm doing this, but every time I sit down, I'm going to get food. So I'm going to keep doing it. That sounds like a good idea to me. And what they're doing now is every time I see that clicker is they say poor and their hands out. And I put my hand up and then I get a treat. And what you would have seen in the first video there is once you've got, once they have had the clicker, and I'm not an animal trainer, by the way. I am a human trainer. Um, but... What you saw there is once you have the clicker, it enables you to use associative learning to be able to find a behavior and reinforce it. So then I was trying to get his hand to come up initially and click, reinforce, hand, click, until I can get a little twitch of him doing it on his own. Click, reinforce, click, reinforce. And the final one there you saw, which was about 10 minutes later, was my sister was able to get to the point where he was doing one hand down, other hand down, and Ten minutes later, he was doing the robot and dancing around the room. Jokes. But if you watch what amazing animal trainers are able to do with dogs at, at um, performance shows, if you look at what people can do with horses, right the way down to what people can do with ducks. And what the, uh, what the book there talks about, the Don't Shoot the Dog, you know, you should never try and train a human until you, or have a kid, because that's ultimately training somebody is, is having a baby. You shouldn't do that until you've tried to train a duck, because no matter how much negative reinforcement, no matter how much you scream or try and hit a duck, it doesn't give, a, doesn't give two shits. Positive reinforcement, and you can get a duck to do amazing things. So that is, that has implications. So what we're saying here is that doing something and positively reinforcing it, and if we can time it so that it can happen together, we can wire movements together. We can wire behaviors together. On our courses, when me and Paul do back to each courses, we actually do this with a participant where we get humans to experience being a dog where Bali doesn't understand English. Um, 
So I like to speak to him as if he can, but he can't. He's looking for the cues around what he understands. So we make humans go through that where we give them reinforcement where someone will go outside the room and they will then have to come back in and we will, as a group, decide what we want the movement to be. Now, the movement would be could be something in obscure like going over there and turn on the light switch, or it could be bending down, and it could be as intricate as bending down and touching your big toe on your right foot with your left finger. And when the person comes back in, then we can only reinforce it by clapping and stopping when they either turn towards the movement and they start doing the right thing. And we ultimately, as a group, then have to try and reinforce to be able to see how we can build behavior. It's a lot of fun, but you learn what your animals go through when you do that because they can't say, what the fuck are you trying to tell me? Do you want my hand here? or my hand here? Will you roll down? Do you want me to roll over? They only understand what you're positively reinforcing. And that's a fascinating thing to go through because what would happen if Bali put his hands up and then this time we don't put, give the clicker, which means a reward, I click something else, which is an electric zapper that's around his neck. So he pops his hand up when I say paw and boop, zap around his neck that gives him a little electric shock. What's likely to happen to the movement or the behavior of Bali offering me his paw? Is that likely to happen again? Skinner's behavioral theories around positive reinforcements, some good outcome, more likely to do it again, negative outcome, less likely. Oh, that wasn't nice, did again, maybe check, just because that did me food in the fruit in the path. Oh, no, that, fuck that, I'm not doing that again. My nervous system, or the, I'm getting punished for that, my nervous system is gonna also maybe protect me from that movement. So here lies the leap where I'm going to bring that to Hopefully you can start to see where this could be relevant for bringing this into humans because if negative outcomes re respond to us doing that thing less, then is pain generally perceived as a positive or a negative thing? If each time you were to, or you had an experience where you bent down and it caused a bout of leg pain that was six weeks, eight weeks, months maybe, and each time you bend down, doop, leg pain or back pain, what is your nervous system learning about that movement? Lewis has popped something in, in, the, in the text there that was, um, that was helpful. But that's exactly what our nervous system is doing, is based on the outcomes, the experiences as to whether we're more or less likely to do it. And that is a really important uh, headway into what we're going to be going through in this session here, because that's what our nervous system experiences, often with persistent pain, it learns a protective output based on experience. That can be triggered by way beyond tissue healing times and give people protective experiences of pain that don't make sense based on a tissue-based tissue based input, but do make sense based on a neurophysiological one. So I'm going to ask you guys to engage in a thought experiment with me, and I'm gonna ask you all to close your eyes. I'm trusting now that you want to go through this and that I see you, but you've got all 17 of you in this group have your eyes closed. And I want you to try and think about a person. And I'm gonna offer you that person to be a grandmother, and that may or may not elicit a good memory for you, but I want you to try and see if you can remember something that you did with a grandmother. Maybe you went to, you know, I used to go to feed the ducks in a local lake, and that is a very vivid memory that I have. I want you to try and imagine your grandmother moving. Can you picture her walking? Can you see her doing something? Maybe you can try and remember something she used to cook for you. A vivid smell that would be in 
the kitchen when she was baking bread, for example, or a meal that you just had every time that you went round there. I want you to open your eyes. Okay, now how we used to understand what you just went through was that every single thing that you just tried to picture with your grandma, how she moved, how she looked, and a memory of what you did, a uh, smell, would be all in the grandma section of your brain. And that would have lit up when you just tried to imagine all of those things. But how we try and understand this nowadays is to be able to appreciate that when you thought about or being able to see her, the part of your brain that processes vision at the back would have lit up. When you remembered that thing that you did with her, the emotional part of your brain would have lit up in an MRI scanner. When you could see her moving, the movement part of your brain just lit up. And that smell would have been setting off that area of olfaction or the smell center in the brain. And actually all of these would have been entwined in a sort of signature or a neural, neural tag as we might communicate it that would have been going off, connecting all those areas when you just thought about your grandma. And if we were to see that in, a, in an MRI scanner, you don't need to read MRIs, but this top line here is a cross section of your brain about there. And you're sat there quietly. It's a nice and quiet scan. Now, when you thought about your grandma, all of these red blobs, which you'll notice all over the brain, light up with metabolic activity. And that illustrates what I just showed you there in that this is the back of our brain, which shows that when you were thinking about what she looked like, you were tapping into the visual part of your brain. The movement part of the brain is here. The, vi the, the smell is here. And all of these illustrate that we don't have one area of your brain that is processing your grandma. Pain works very much in the same way. And that's an important, it's an important thing to appreciate because when we can see that our brain works in this way of connecting all the different parts, we can produce a, just like you were able to connect with your grandma, what she looked like, how she moved, a memory of something you did with her, your pain experience will be very similar. In fact, it will be similar in the, in the concept that it will be ex all of these things that you've been through. So what has happened to you in the past, your current context, your movement, your expectations, your, your, sense, your sensory experience, so what you're smelling, all of these things will have an individual neuro tag that would make up your pain experience. And this is a plastic process that is malleable. And when I say plastic, it means that it can change. And that ties us to back to that video at the start there with barley. So imagine barley is seeing food. He has a smell that is, that smells good. He has an output or he has a, a neural tag that is an output to produce salivation and preparation for eating. That would be the neural tag that would connect to that output. And every time that we produce that neural tag by showing him the food, we click a little clicker. So that then the auditory part of Barley's brain is then wiring in an extra little loop or network to this pattern. That means that ultimately I don't actually need to then show him food, just showing him or giving him the clicker elicits, elicits the output of salivation. That's associative learning. That's exactly what we went through in, in playing around with Bali there at the start. And this has implications for your pain experience in terms of, can you make the leap here now to be able to see how if we, you know, bending down, we could say, or shoulder overhead, or if it's the neck, it might be turning this way. We've had an experience that through that movement in the past that has caused a bad experience. How our nervous system isn't projecting out salivation like barley, it's projecting out pain to protect us. Our nervous system is plastic and it's looking, trying to look after us. We've talked about this idea of how our nervous system becomes a sensitized alarm system. And this is a way that our nervous system can learn 
to be able to protect us. I will often send my patients a video before this of Lorimer Mosley and his famous TED talk about why things hurt. Has anybody in this group heard of or seen that? Martin, do you care to share what you remember from his story? Uh, there's a snake biting a guy up the leg and then it uh, goes like, uh, I don't know. The next time you feel something on your leg, you think it's a snake again and uh, your brain can fool you and he has a very nice analogy of explaining that sort of uh, behavior in the brain. Fantastic. And the fact that you can remember that again reiterates and illustrates the power of storytelling. The, the power of storytelling illustrates that that is how children learn, it's how we as adults learn. And what Laura Mosley has done is really bring that to our awareness as healthcare professionals because in healthcare what we're doing so much of the time is educating. We are trying to support people to be able to, to learn things. And what that story does with Lorimer is illustrate how he was walking in the bush and one day he was you know he'd always get scratches on his legs but then one day one of those scratches isn't a scratch it's a snake bite that is a very deadly brown snake in Australia that leads to Lorimer nearly dying and he doesn't die but one day in the future he is then back walking in the bush he tells in his funny Australian accent and his his particular way where he then gets scratched on the side of the leg in the same place as where he was bitten by the snake and he is writhing on the floor in agony. His nervous system or his neuro tag for the pain or the input on the leg there went into his experience, went into the processing of his sensation right now, current context to be able to produce an output was last time nearly died it's appropriate for us to really produce protection here. And that is an amazing way to try and bring awareness to the fact, to, to this idea of how we, pain is an experience that draws on all of these parts. And that is so important because it has implications for how we might try and work with that. Because if we can learn something, what can we also do? Because this, this, is, this is not conscious, oh, you tricked me. This is associative patterning in not just our brain, but our nervous system, right way through to the spinal cord, right through to the peripheral nerves. It's our nervous system, it's our person, our consciousness, we don't know where it is, but it's somewhere embedded in this experience that is, that is the, the human experience of pain. Okay, and as Lewis just said there, if we can learn something, we can also unlearn something. And if I was going to try and get Bali to unlearn the poor there that we saw at the start, how might I go about that? Bali has learned that doing this gets him something that he really wants. So negative reinforcement is one way. So that would be the, uh, the zapper on the neck that I said there, um, Sam. Or the other one, Poppy, as you said there, would be to not simply not reinforce it. Now, those are two different approaches because with negative reinforcement, and again, this is why um, that book Don't Shoot the Dog says you should never have babies to, until you try to train a chicken is because, or a duck that is say, is because if you negatively reinforce this, and you'll see people will do this with training a dog, for example, that they smack the dog or they rub the dog's nose in the piss, whatever it will be, to really give them a negative reinforcement of the behavior. Now often that is done way after the behavior that they've done, so the dog never actually associates the movement as, or they will eventually, but then what they will do is they'll shut down all behaviors. So you end up with them not offering behaviors that you can reinforce. So that's where positive reinforcement or extinction, as Poppy said there, is to just simply stop rewarding it, do something different and get a different output. And that has, sorry, Lewis, how long do they believe something takes to unlearn? 
until the data become a habit. Yeah, there's some theories around that, Lewis, but um, I think, again, when we talk about uh, in motor learning, it is far easier to learn something correct the first time than it is to unlearn it. So if you learn a bad habit, you'll hear people say it is way harder to unlearn that and then rebuild a new habit. And that is something I think that's on an individual basis. Um, but what I showed there with, with Bali was you know, once you, you can learn a skill and the same as you guys, when you've learned skills like that, I think it would be an individual response in terms of unlearning it. And often with extinction where you stop rewarding it, you probably wouldn't see a, 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 an exact moment that they, that they unlearn it. It would just be something that would sort of merge over time. But here in lies where a lot of, or the basis of, if neurons that fire together, wire together, another saying that we can have is neurons that fire apart, wire apart. So to be able to experience the movement, but in a different way so that the movement, the expectation, the context, something different around the movement, which it could be lifting the shoulder, it could be turning the head, it could be bending down to the floor. But if we can give your, your body a new way of doing that, that it doesn't have a learned pattern associated with an output of pain, or the protective mechanism of pain, we have an opportunity to try and violate your nervous system's learned protection. This leads us into being able to introduce whatever ways that you might have to create tasks that will make the person motivated on solving the task, but it requires them to include whatever movement that it is that you're interested in, seeing if it changes when you change something. Okay, so that would be where I would bring in things that are in my skill set where I'm comfortable. You know, I, I'm teaching with the third years at the moment and we're looking at McGill, we're looking at Mackenzie, these prescriptive A plus B then C. This is where we can start to really bring in our individuality of being able to find a way to get someone to experience something differently. And this is where your skill set and your background can come to the fore in finding a way to get someone to lift their arm over in a, overhead in a way that you ha, are comfortable and experienced. It's where I might use things like capoeira or circus or boxing or dance that I've got into some experience for myself to make just like in McGill, you have level one, then you have level two, then you have level three, you have this track of progressions. We still have the same concept of progressions around other more maybe more free flowing or less prescriptive tasks to be able to offer as progressions so i can't do this with you in person but this is where you should be able to draw back on some of the things that you would have done with us in functional management last year but what i am going to do is this is exactly so i've gone through this process with patients and got to the point where my clinical reasoning here now is for us to try and experience a movement in a different way to how you've maybe done it in the past. Or novel movement is the fancy word that we tend to use. But to be honest with you, the research around why some of the more mainstream types of exercise, like DNS is something that people do, dynamic neuromuscular systems, which is a series of following how a baby might develop from born to 12 months old you know it's it's not necessarily it's not better than anything else same as anything same as any of these other exercises but they seem to help people and often it's just the fact that because they're giving someone novel movement the nervous system hasn't learned to be able to protect against that movement and we can have a good experience with movement and that's really what this is all bringing this around full circle to is what we're trying to do is give that person a positive experience with movement that enables their nervous system to shift and change. You'll hear Craig Liebenson and see the guys talking about this a lot now. It's becoming much more of the mainstream talk, but it's the basis of why five years ago when I started, I 
took the decision that I wanted to influence the context around when someone comes to see me for help, which is why you ultimately see my videos and my clinical practice out of a gym, because it influences the context and the environment that we saw in the WHO guidelines there to be able to harness that positive experience of movement. You know, in terms of context, which is something that, that, um, that Dave Newell and David Byfield, you know, they talk a lot about these things. You know, what is the implications of having x-rays on the wall with degenerative spines showing, you know, the, the way that a spine could degenerate? What's the implications of having a spinal model, a big red bulging disc? You know, these things in terms of the context, all of these things are influencing a nervous system's, a person's requirement for protection or detection of threat. And that's where, again, this leads into, so what I'm going to offer you guys is to be able to think about drawing upon skill sets that you may have. But I'm gonna guide you through some tasks that I would use to be able to set my patient up with problem solving and some simple progressions on that task based around the clinical reasoning so my patient is now exploring new ways to move. Does that, does that leap and that clinical reasoning there are you guys able to follow and does that make sense? Because that is what, what we need to be able to make sense for our patient. Because what I'm going to get you to do now, you don't have to do it, but you can write this down. I don't have this filmed, would be to take your shoes off. And if you are going to take your shoes off, I'm going to offer you to pop my foot, yeah. your shoe on the sole of your foot okay and for obvious reasons your body will have to be in a certain position to be able to do that without it falling off because the only other rules are going to be no chewing gum no sellotape nothing is allowed to touch the shoe apart from the sole of that foot Okay, so if you haven't figured it out, you're probably on your back by now, or you would be if you're going to have a go at this afterwards. And as a task, what I'm going to do is I've set the rules there. You can't touch the shoe by anything other than the sole of that foot. And the first goal is going to be getting your tummy onto the floor. And that's it. I'm not going to tell you how to do it, I'm not going to tell you what's wrong. You're going to if you're having a go at it now, you're going to realize that you can go a couple of directions. You can actually do more than a couple of directions. This is where we're starting to bring in problem solving. Problem solving is where we have the brain having to engage from top down. It's where you'll see when I'm working with my elderly gentleman, why I might introduce puzzles into my clinical practice or games on a tablet. But problem solving has a very big place in contemporary practice because it ultimately leads to a person's increase self-efficacy. They're not just looking for answers. We need to be able to guide, to shift them to that point. So you've got, you've got your shoe on your foot and you're gonna try this because it's gonna be on both feet and you're gonna try and get your tummy onto the floor. If you can get your tummy onto the floor, progression number one is going to be that you can continue all the way and get back onto your back without breaking any of the rules. Okay, so if you're doing this now, then fantastic. You're not gonna get this because the progressions I've given you are going to be at least a couple of weeks worth of work. Um, so you need to be able to know the progressions. These are obviously aren't exhaustive. This is just ones that I've, that I've used and, and, and developed from what I've exposed myself to. And the next one is going to be that you continue the, all the way to your back. So you can do a full circle on the floor. If you can do that on both legs, then I'm going to offer you to try that with two shoes. So now you're on your back and you've got both feet on, uh, shoes on both feet, okay? And you have the same task. You're going to get your tummy onto the floor. You're going to get your back onto the floor without losing the shoes, okay? And you could go left, you could go right. You could go over your shoulders, whatever you come up with, I would be interested. And when I give this to patients, I am often interested to see what they come up with. And sometimes 
it will be things that I haven't thought of. And again, becomes a bit of fun. Patient is, or person, you guys, me, we're trying to solve the task. And in the process, what I'm also looking at is how is this person's nervous system responding to that task, which requires you to bend through flexion, through rotation of the low back, changing the context, changing the focus, changing all of these things. Do we change the output of pain? If those progressions are achievable, try it with a stick. Okay, so you're going to get one of those dowels that you see us using in the gym, and you can go monkey feet so you can hold it with the toes, but you can't touch the stick with anything other than that one foot. The stick also cannot touch the floor. Same task, onto your tummy, onto your back. You could also watch when you have a go at this movement to see how this could be clinically reasoned by you to be a hip exercise, a low back exercise, a neck exercise when you're on your tummy and you're looking back at your, at your shoe. Can we find an access point, a way in based on novel, the clinical reasoning being novel movement and we are finding ways that we can hopefully make engaging for someone to want to go away and achieve by next week because that's where the essence of pitching things right are if i give you an exercise now that you just do first time that's not reinforcing that's not rewarding that's not going to motivate you to want to achieve equally if i give you something that you fail every time equally not reinforcing hopeless and you don't stick at it but if i give you something that you get success maybe once and you can't do it again so you get that right on the fringe of what someone's able to do in terms of success and pitch something then just outside with those progressions as an example that's where it's motivating fuck i want to get that add in an element of what if an element of not reinforcing every time so when you're talking about clicker training there comes a point where you don't reinforce with 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 food every time you go to 50 percent. you go to 25 percent. you add in the element of well, I didn't get food that time. What if anticipation dopamine through the roof when you add in an element of what if? Enter the world of Las Vegas. That is the entire basis of what gambling is based on. Dopamine anticipation, that is what is incredibly reinforcing. So how do we use that and how do we understand that to try and apply that with the behaviors that we want to mold, which is exercise and exercise adherence. Another option, if you're still engaged, maybe you're bored and you want to go, maybe you're, maybe you're immersed in these tasks, then either way, I'll offer another task, which would be, which I use for seeing how someone might bend down and changing the constraints, seeing if that influences their experience. And that, would be a get up and down from the ground task. Okay, so simply I might ask someone, the first the goal of this task is going to be, there's no rules apart from, you got to get your back onto the floor and then get back onto your feet. I want you to do that three times and I want you to do that three times onto your tummy. So you start in position standing up, you've got to get your middle of your back onto the floor, you've got to get your tummy onto the floor and stand up. And for you guys, young, fit healthcare professionals, again, that would probably be not enough of a stimulus for me to leave you with that one. That's too easy. That's, yeah, someone else. That might be their level of and their most meaningful thing to be able to do. Okay, so that is something that we, we need to be able to regress that. So it may not be going all the way down to the floor, but I want you to get down to this bench and then get back up and maybe do that a few times. I'm gonna offer you a progression on your level. So you're going to get down to the ground, same task, except this time, you're gonna have one hand on the top of your head. Anything else goes, you can get up and down from the ground. The only rule you can't break is this one that I've made, and guess what, I'm making the rules, which means I can change it at any point, that's the essence of constraint-based rules. Unfortunately, there's no research paper that I can tell you when you should or shouldn't change the rules. You have to develop this from working with a person. But 
So that was too easy. Fantastic. We're going to do the same task now. Hands on your head. Back of your back of your uh, your back onto the floor. Your tummy onto the floor. That is past. I'm going to offer you to be able to hold your left foot with your left hand. Back onto the floor, tummy onto the floor. That will start getting challenging for some of us because it's gonna require a little bit of an interesting transition from the floor, but we can uh, figure that out, I'm pretty sure, with a little bit of practice and perseverance. Final one I'll leave you, leave you with for today will be left hand on the left foot and right hand on top of your head. You can't break contact. Your left hand stays from your laces below, so not ankle, laces below on your foot. Your right hand stays on top of your head. You can't lose those two points of contact. You're gonna get down to the ground, onto your tummy, down to the ground on your back, and I'd be interested to see who is able to do that and if you can maybe there's some other ways you could progress that to make it more challenging but tasks as examples for when I'm doing this with you clinical reasoning we're trying to experience movements that have maybe been a problem in a different way is our clinical reasoning to see if we can change the output does that make sense you guys able to follow that this opens up for you to really bring in bring in an individuality to your to your exercise programs and I'm also going to upload a um, have I got on here is research research using virtual reality where you can take people who have back pain when they're cycling uphill to give them virtual reality where they are cycling uphill on a static bike maybe but they are seeing that they're going downhill and how you can change people's pain experience purely with virtual reality very interesting again ties into this whole idea how context and the environment is super important so that's the another task that i could set you is to be able to say so i've just given you a couple of different tasks there based on novel movement problem solving would be you identify a movement or a task, can you do that somewhere else in a different context and see if it causes a different output? Something that I use to be able to explain to my patients is when I go on city breaks and I walk in cities, I get back pain. So when I go, if I want to go to, to Edinburgh, if I want to go to Berlin, if I want to go on these city breaks where I like going and checking out and be, doing the tourist thing, I have to literally plot every 10 minutes where there's, a, where there's a coffee shop to sit down. You know, trying to reason that from a tissue-based perspective. I train, I train regularly. I can walk in mountains all day long. Something about that context, my nervous system has led, you know, something in the past has led to where maybe I was made to go shopping or something when I was a kid, but I get back pain when I'm walking in the city. I don't get back pain when I'm walking in mountains. And again, I, I, I clinically reason that to myself around some sort of associative learning that has taken place because from a tissue-based understanding, I can't explain why my back hurts and I have to sit down if I'm walking down for any period of time in the city. But therein lies a, you know, if you were to try and de-associate de my, my learned association there with walking in the city, you would maybe give me a little bit of time in the city, then come out of the city and grade exposure over time to try and get the experience of being in the city without causing the output. Logistically much more difficult than applying that to something like bending down or any other movement that you could identify that you're working with your patient, shoulder overhead, turning the head and so forth. I hope that was helpful for you. And that's one of the most important things that underpins how we make a lot of our rehab programs um, very fun, based on lots of things that is um, limited only by your own creativity and imagination, and to be able to grade it for the person in front of you. I will upload the resources to, um, to Blackboard, and uh, I will see you guys next week.
Thank you.